latest episode of the She Speaks series from Let Her Speak. I'm Catherine Porth, the founder of Let Her Speak. And today I have an amazing entrepreneur, a woman who is trying to do everything that she can to help the planet and, and help sustainability and global warming. Her name is Laura Zapata. She is the co-founder of Clear Loop. And I am so excited to have you on to share your story today, Laura. Thank you so much, Catherine, for having me on. I'm excited to be here. So the first thing I would love for you to talk about is what your journey has been from, you know, where you started or where you thought you saw your career going to where you are now with starting Clear Loop. Sure. So um, I, if you looked at my career objectively, um, you'd probably not necessarily see that entrepreneurship was in the cards. But, um, you know, you hear of all these people, especially in Shark Tank, you see, you know, they all started businesses early on and they've done all these things and it was just, you know, written in stone. Um, and, you know, if I look back, I say, well, yeah, I started a little jewelry making thing and some chocolate uh, making things. But but it was not really, you know, I didn't see myself necessarily as heading into entrepreneurship. I really started being very passionate about politics. That was the thing that made me tick. Uh, and it was uh, so, so interesting to me that I went to college thinking for sure I was going to be studying um, something in, in government and politics. And I did that. Um, and after graduating from college, I realized, you know, I wanted to work on the Hill and I wanted to go to Capitol Hill and see what that was like. But I didn't realize then, um, or as I was uh, getting ready to graduate, that I would love communication so much. And so communications is really the, the part about politics that I enjoyed. Uh, and it was something for me to just know a little bit about a lot of things uh, and be able to just communicate it in plain language. That was really the thing that was fascinating to me is how do you turn all these like fancy schmancy politics things into and policy things into real deal, you know, words and, and be able to make it accessible to, to everybody to understand what was happening in, in DC. So I did that. And then that uh, found me into the world of communications and uh, in the world of corporate communications. I found myself in San Francisco soon or after being in DC on both the House and Senate side and ended up working for Uber, um, which at the time was a company that was trying to break into new cities. Um, in the old sort of adage of like, we're a technology company, yay, was not working uh, as well. And so they needed more people to be able to communicate sort of the benefits of, you know, drinking and driving and how um, they were going to be tackling that issue um, and sort of how technology could work with cities um, to tackle some of these big issues. And so um, when I joined in 2014, it was still fairly early Uber days and uh, I was in a whole new world and, and I saw that skill of being able to communicate you know some of these more complex things into just everyday language because um, that was that was just as important as the product itself um, and so after after doing that for a little bit I jumped back into politics did communications one more time for the for Hillary Clinton's presidential uh, campaign I was in Ohio I found myself all over the country basically you know doing these things and taking this this newfound passion for for communicating. Um, but um, at the end of all of that, uh, I found myself back here at home in Tennessee and realizing um, that that skill had other ways so we could leverage that to um, being able to go into entrepreneurship and uh, that's where clear loop the, the story of clear loop sort of begins about two years ago um, here in nashville as a way to just how do we make it really really simple for these companies to be able to communicate their investments and in reducing their greenhouse gases uh, and make it make climate change uh, a little bit more accessible less uh, heady uh, so that we can make it easier for companies to invest and for their customers and their investors to be able to see what they're investing in, which is uh, helping us clean up the grid. So then since you're, you're really good at communicating and I know um, things like understanding carbon emissions, greenhouse gases, you know, global warming, yeah. climate change, you know, how, how people are perceiving it versus what it actually is. Um, can you explain can, how Clear Loop fits into all of that as far as like, the changes and, and the impact that you're trying to make in that area? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think when we first started looking at it and started 
clear loop. Um, we were really coming out at, at this from outside and an outsider's perspective. Um, but I have two other co-founders um, uh, and both of them, I mean, one of them is, is Governor Bredesen, former governor of the state of Tennessee, but the other gentleman, um, Bob Horney and I both have this sort of, you know, uh, communications and political public affairs background. So we were not coming at this from um, sort of uh, people in the know of sustainability and science. Um, but we learned a lot and we researched a lot. And really the most important thing for us was how do we make it, you know, climate change is already really scary. Um, science is already very intimidating. Um, and so how do we make it really, really simple to understand that, hey, we can invest in our communities by building more clean energy infrastructure. Everybody likes jobs and clean energy uh, or, or infrastructure. Um, and those sort of investments are the investments that we're talking about. We're talking about going into communities and being able to retrofit the, um, the existing sort of infrastructure that helps uh, bring us electricity. So building new solar projects. Um, and the whole idea is basically let's clean up the grid. It's, it's dirty. It's causing lots of different effects, you know, both environmental but also health effects in our communities. Um, and so here's an opportunity for us to really do something about it and also bring all the other sort of benefits, not just environmental, but you know, this is health and this is uh, economic vitality in some of the com in some of these communities like here in Tennessee that would otherwise maybe get, be getting left behind. So bringing some private capital dollars to build new solar projects, help clean up our grid um, and bring you know the sort of other benefits that happen as a result of that, and that's that's a very that's less about you know the scary science greenhouse gases, and it's much more about how do we invest back in our communities and do something that's both positive for the environment as well as for um, our economic vitality. Have you run into as you're coming into these communities, you know, like backlash or or people? Um, be for lack of understanding maybe pushing against what you're trying to do because it's a change and they don't quite understand it and, and how do you um, address that yeah i think that it, it some of the issues around climate change have been very politicized as we know and so i think that just trying to take it out of that realm it's more about you know being able to um, talk with folks really about the, the community building aspect of some of, of this type of investment um, is really sort of meeting people where they are. And I know that that sounds really basic and simple, but just that basic concept, I think sometimes gets lost by like, you know, people trying to be very helpful um, and just, you know, running and ramming themselves into different communities. Um, and I think that just understanding that there's a sort of, you, you gotta win um, some champions, you know, to do, you gotta, you gotta make those friends. Um, and so it's gonna be really important for, um, it really to build those relationships and that really it, it takes it takes work um, on the forefront um, but really it's less about making it political and much more about how can we make this uh, a realistic investment into a community and you know people like uh, seeing that their com communities are getting um, the types of investments that we're talking about where your tax base grows, um, private capital is being used to to build this new infrastructure. Um, and it's sort of, it's it's sort of investments that haven't been seen in some of these communities in years and years. Um, so that's that's the exciting part when when you start breaking it down in its pieces and make it less about like, you know, we're here and we're here to help um, sort of approach it, it kind of seems like yeah it's not so much the uh yeah we're superheroes here to save yeah. you, all you people that you yes. didn't realize you needed to be saved and instead uh a, more of an empathetic approach um which is yeah meeting them where they are so um it it seems like then that that's been working really well for you guys and and you've seen um some success yeah, I think that's that's the key component to what we're trying to do and really being very intentional about how do we seek out these communities because we have some of the data that sort of underlies what we're trying to do. So we're basically doing two things, two big data components that help inform where we want to go build and invest. And so one of them is how how much sun does a particular place get? And thankfully, there's lots of wonderful scientists out there in the world that have mapped out the United States and have shown, you know, basically how much sun does the does the country get? And the good news is that our, our country gets a ton of sun, uh, especially here in the Sun Belt. 
Um, and then the second thing that we're looking at is how much, um, how many, how much carbon, how many pounds of carbon get emitted every time we turn on our lights um, in different parts of the country. And unfortunately, that's not equal right now. That's not um, the, the environmental impact that we have of turning on our lights here in Tennessee versus that in, in California is very different because the things that we're using to make electricity are different. And so in places like West Virginia or Minnesota, where they're very fossil fuel reliant, very reliant on coal and other fossil fuels, um, versus places like Vermont and California that have access, much more access to clean energy, whether it's hydro or even here in Tennessee, where we have access to carbon free energy with nuclear. Um, it's, it's just a different impact on the environment. So what we're saying is we need to go focus on the places that have the dirtiest grids that that's what we call um, dirty grids is, you know, they're very fossil fuel reliant. And so we're focusing on these communities that um, where the impact of turning on the lights is much more uh, negative than uh, it would be in other places and where the sun is still, you know, very potent. And so by focusing, so we're using that data to sort of start narrowing down what we're, what parts of the country we're focused on and they happen to be the middle part of the country. Um, and then layering in other information, um, but also the willingness of a community to want to have that sort of investment where they see, hey, you know, our people need more jobs uh, or our tax base, you know, by building this piece of infrastructure in, in our city or in our town, we're now growing um, the number of teachers that we can hire or the firefighters that we can help support um, because it, it, it adds to sort of the the, the taxes that are being paid into the county because this is a piece of infrastructure that pays taxes. Um, so, so those things sort of like there's the like hard data aspect of this, but then there's also the, you know, what are the, the characteristics of different communities that welcome um, these investments and are also excited to figure out ways to, to bring more jobs and sort of new um, cutting edge jobs other than construction, um, like, you know, there's a bunch of electricians that could um, now be able to service um, these these solar projects. So it, it's sort of a combination of there's the hard stuff and then there's the stuff um, that you know every community is is unique and sort of the welcoming environment is it makes a real difference. I I love that that story of this this ecosystem that flourishes because I think a lot of times whenever we're hearing about greenhouse gases and and um, carbon footprints and global warming and all of that it, it's much more about like a doomsday in yeah. the media of like <laughs> you know where all is lost you know i don't and scientists are saying we might never be able to turn back what the damage that we've done you know, and you're always hearing all these negative things um and you don't necessarily hear and you hear about the backlash but you don't hear about what the what the benefits of doing certain things that that are relatively you know for lack of a better term like easy to implement from yeah. you know from the standpoint of all the different options you have so i love that 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 the story that you have and the the view of what you've been able to see is that there's this flourishment to the ecosystem that can happen yeah absolutely and i think that that's that was the when we started looking at this and we started creating clear loop it was very very important for us to stay in this i mean if we're going to be sunny and we're going to be about solar we might as well embrace that um that ethos and because it, it it is really dark um and people don't necessarily react to negative things in the way in, in the way that we um you know, hope that they would. And so I think that standing up for something positive in the world is much more powerful. Uh, it's much more difficult to get there, but it's much more powerful um, than, than uh, you know, doing the the sort of doom and gloom and, and the negativity. And it's also hard to relate. It's hard to relate to the, the, you know, we understand that the polar bears were suffering, but that seems really far away from my day-to-day -day life. Um, but I understand that here in my community, you know, there are some investments that, um, you know, it's not fair. Why, why should California have all the investment in clean energy and clean energy jobs? Why can't we have it here in Tennessee? And I think that that was our perspective. That was certainly my, my perspective when I was coming into this, just sort of looking at this like, yes, there's the environmental aspect, but then there's a whole lot of, you know, sort of the, the equity of it all and just the ability to have access to clean energy and all those benefits that should also benefit 
my community where I where I grew up, um, and we shouldn't be left behind. So that's that's really um, the place that we're coming at it, and I think. I think we found some some good traction as a result of being genuine in in the way that we're approaching in the first place. I remember you mentioning in the the spotlight that we did on you um, a little while back that um, because you're so new, the the pandemic was basically just uh, well, a few months after you guys officially opened for business. Yeah. So you had to completely rewrite everything that you're planning on doing. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit about like what that that transition was about and and how you arrived at at where your market is now? Yeah, oh, Catherine, you're giving me some flashbacks of a year ago, but uh, it, it's actually I think that you know I was talking to somebody yesterday who mentioned who said you know I think that what we got with the pandemic you know of all the negative if there's a silver lining we got the gift of time and I think that for us it was we were really focused on. As we were you know, launching ClearLoop, um, we, we still had the same sort of basic principles of the communities we were trying to um, target, the, you know, the, this whole idea of trying to clean up the grid with private sector investment, where we really um, had to rethink our strategy was around what, what private sector money we were using, um, because what we initially um, thought was um, First, we thought, well, people that make products want to um, sort of take the carbon footprint of that product and say, we're doing something positive about it. Here's the new solar panel we've built as a result of, of this carbon footprint. Um, what we then found in, in late 2019, um, feels like ages ago, was that the travel industry was getting some pressure and that you know travel was becoming, flight shaming was becoming a sort of a thing, a cultural thing here in the US. Uh, and people are starting to talk a lot more about it. So we really thought that that was going to be our our industry. That was going to be our first um, set of customers. And we were talking to some great uh, travel brands about the possibility of helping them reduce their impact on the environment by helping us clean up the grid and build more solar projects. And then uh, the pandemic happened. I was literally supposed to go to New York City um, the week everything shut down. And it was very interesting uh, because at first we were like, wait, wait, this is just like everybody else. This is gonna be a two week thing and let's just regroup and try to look inward and see what other processes we could do internally that could, uh, you know, when you're moving fast in a startup, you sort of forget to sometimes uh, do everything really, really smoothly and sort of have a nice, and so, you know, we started just focusing inward. Um, and building processes and you know cleaning up some of our documents and our folders and sort of like letting the world um, get back to normal and then soon we realized that you know wait a second this is this is changing the world um, that we know and travel is not going to be coming back anytime soon so let's prepare and try to think about other places and so um, I think Governor Bredesen had some quote about, uh, and somebody shared it with us back then, about um, how you take the the you, you take the, the crappy times to get to get used to to get um, start working towards the good times to like prepare for the good times, something like that. I'm totally misquoting him. He doesn't say he didn't say crappy, but um, the the point being that we really thought, okay, this is our chance to just start a new. Um, in terms of who, what kind of companies would be interested in something like that. And what we found was that there was a lot of willing ears, um, industry agnostic, and just a lot of people who had one, a little bit more time on their hands to pay attention to important issues of what was happening because they were at home, you know, with their children. And so they wanted to get in front of, you know, business meeting and, and try to figure out, you know, learn new ideas and sort of be, um, you know, sort of push and, and uh, wrestle with the, the concept that we were trying to pitch them on. Um, and then we, by the end of last year, we found a few other um, startups that were really, um, they were building their business models all around sustainability and they just needed that one little piece of carbon, um, the, the last remaining uh, piece to, to offset their carbon footprint. And uh, we announced that we were uh, partnering with them uh, as they're, they're still, um, uh, fairly small, but it was really exciting to have our first uh, set of customers, even through a tough year, and to be able to announce that we have a project that we will be doing some groundbreaking on here in, in Jackson, Tennessee this summer. Wow. So I, I just think it's amazing, though, that it wasn't a necessary and all is lost. Um, but instead, you saw it as an opportunity 
um, to, to reframe because regardless of what you're doing, it's, it's beneficial to so many different people. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a great, a great story and a great way to look at what can come out of 2020, 2021 from a silver land perspective. Yeah, I think it's just sort of like the, the problem will still be there. Um, and so the problem we're trying to tackle will still be there. Maybe it'll look slightly different into the, the types of companies that can help us tackle it, maybe slightly different, but just sort of, you know, keeping heads down and not being totally dismayed that we didn't get to do all these great uh, deals, even though, you know, I'm sure I, there were hours and moments and still, you know, the, the up and down of, of my uh, emotions, if you put me uh, to a to some sort of test, you see that there were you know, definitely dark uh, moments. Um, but I think that it's just all in service of uh, knowing that we are tackling something real that we're really passionate about um, being able to bring this idea to life. And we just needed to hold on a little bit longer if we could uh, and just be creative about how we were gonna tackle this problem, even if it wasn't exactly what our business plan intended to do. So one thing I would love to do is um, to rewind a little bit to, because you mentioned you you didn't really see yourself in a entrepreneur role um, growing up in, and communications was was your one of your happy places. So coming out of working with Hillary Clinton's campaign in Ohio, and then coming to Tennessee, um, continuing to working in um, political communications. What did that transition look like? Because I, um, like you mentioned, like to that to an outsider, it would seem like, whoa, where did all of this come from? But obviously, yeah. there are links to it that that most people might not see or understand. Yeah. So I had a really interesting experience. I uh, so when I finished in sixteen in that campaign, I went back to Uber I, and I became the head of communications for Uber Eats. And what was interesting about that experience was that you're basically growing a startup within a startup. Um, and it was changing the product offering, right? It was no longer sort of this, you know, what people saw as a car taxi service. It was now going to bring you food. And that was a little jarring um, for a lot of people. So we had to really communicate exactly what we were doing and, and sort of be building a business within a business. That was also the year in 20, 2017 when, um, Uber was in the news a lot with lots of controversy. And so it was very interesting to sort of be starting something new um, and have a seat at the table for a very new sort of startup within a startup um, and be advising and sort of, you know, getting to sort of share or definitely share my opinion about how we were going to frame um, this, this new business venture that Uber was doing in the context that we were in and in, outside of the context that we were in. We were already trying to communicate a, a totally new business venture for, for, for the company. And it was then that I realized that a lot of the stuff that I was saying and my opinions and my ideas actually had business links and they informed business decisions or they were business decisions. Um, they weren't just communications decisions. It wasn't just me, you know, pitching a, a reporter about a particular story that somebody else was bringing to me. It was me sort of coming up with what the story was in uh, with, the, with the head of, of Uber Eats at the time. And I think that that was really empowering for me to be able to see myself um, and, and you know, credit to, to those uh, folks and to um, the, the person in charge in particular, and his name is, is uh, Jason Drogase. So being able to be part of that sort of consortium and uh, people at the table who were informing, you know, whether it was from engineering, communications and, and business development, and that I had a say in what the business was doing was really important to me. And I think that that's when I started seeing that, hey, this is, this is, I'm, I'm already doing it. It's not my company. And um, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is making people a lot of money, other people a lot of money. Um, so I, I too can, can probably do this. Um, and so when I decided to leave Uber Eats, I left to come to Tennessee, which is my home state, because I thought um, the reason for it was politics. Again, um, you know, I had to scratch that itch and the former governor um, was running for Senate. And so for me, it was just sort of a chance to come back home to Tennessee, see what Tennessee was like after I had left Tennessee after, uh, after high school. 
and uh, be a little bit closer to my parents and sort of exercise this muscle. And what I found there during that campaign was also that I, a lot of the decisions and a lot of the opinions that I had were informing real deal decisions that the campaign was making. Um, and it was my, you know, my uh, perspective or my opinion that that led to certain decisions. And so I thought all of those things helped me realize that I had it in me, uh, that I could also uh, do something myself and that, you know, um, that it was me at the table, that it was me being the decision maker and that, you know, I could take that to something else uh, and, and sort of run um, with that. And so I had thought about the possibility of starting something and maybe going back to Silicon Valley and, and trying my hand at something. I, I didn't really know. I thought at first it was maybe like a recycling uh, play or something like that, um, because I found it very uh, jarring that in San Francisco, everybody had all these little uh, ways to recycle and compost and had all these different things. And here in Tennessee, it was hard pressed to, to get, uh, to find exactly, you know, to make sure that you weren't messing up which kind of plastic and that just put such pressure um, on, on all of us consumers. But um, the point being that I had seen myself in this role um, because I was given the space to do it. Um, and when the opportunity came up, the governor uh, approached me and and um, and Bob about the possibility of us working together in this new life um, with, with this idea about helping companies um, do something really tangible about cleaning up the grid. It, it felt like, you know, here's my chance to show that I can, all these experiences and all these things that I have and bring to the table are not just unique, but they are of value. Um, and I still sometimes, you know, wonder how it all came together, but it just being able to see myself in those roles um, and, and getting that uh, uh, responsibility, but also that um, opportunity to to lead uh, was really, really important to, to what we do today in, in co-founding this company. Uh, I mean, one thing that we found is within Let Her Speak and is some of the research that we do is that of all the different barriers that can hold a woman back from seeking out a, you know, that executive role at um, a corporation or becoming an entrepreneur and, and growing and leading her own company, um, the, the biggest one to get over is their own negative self-perception and their own internal barriers that they set up of telling themselves, I, I, I can't do this. This isn't, this isn't what I, I see myself as being capable of doing. So, um, but it sounds like, you know, for you, I'm, I'm assuming that you probably have had your days just like everybody else. Yes. And still, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yeah, do you have any advice or, or any thoughts on, on personally, you know, how do you tackle those moments of self-doubt and, and imposterism and, and things like that to remind yourself that, no, I am capable and I can do this? Yeah, I think it's it's very intimidating. And this, the energy sustainability world is still very intimidating. It's very um, dominated by men. It's very dominated by white men specifically. And I think that all those, you know, the intersection of who I am and my identity, so, you know, very much goes into play in every where I go. Um, I think that um, I don't have a super clean, beautiful answer because it's still, you know, it happens very much day to day about, you know, should I be doing this and why should they believe me? And maybe they should be, you know, it, it, it definitely plays. But I think that the amount of energy that I have recognized that I can spend sort of, you know, giving in to these, uh, what can be very loud voices of internal uh, struggle and questions about whether or not, you know, I'm fit to do this, um, is much better served and funneled to do, let's just do it and see what happens. Um, and I think that just sort of like worst case scenario is okay. It, it, breaks apart and it doesn't work. Um, I guess I've had my share of experiences with, with uh, you know, losing uh, being in, in politics, but I think being able to sort of say, okay, I'm spending a lot of energy wondering and worrying about what other people may think or how they may perceive me and sort of trying to say, okay, that energy, I'm going to try to 
push it over here and try to just do the thing because if you're really busy, Laura, then you you can you know make those those uh, those voices that are internal and sometimes external. I mean, I think that the number of times that I've seen or heard or felt that somebody else um, you know did not really you know had questions about whether or not I should be uh, doing this or in this role. I think that that has. Uh, you know, that's definitely that, that helps confirm a lot of the questions uh, about, you know, the skepticism within myself. But I think just allowing myself the space to say, okay, there's going to be, there's going to be doubters. I'm going to have moments of self-doubt. I'm not always going to be right. Um, most people are not right all the time. And so let's just have a humble um, approach to this. And we're going to need all hands on deck to the ultimate problem that we're trying to solve with uh, climate change. We're just going to offer one tool. And I'm one of these people that is willing to take up the, the you know, pick up and, and try to dig in alongside everybody else. And I think that that combination of trying to be humble about what we're doing, as well as just trying to channel that energy to um, just staying busy on doing the thing as opposed to worrying about doing the thing um, has been very helpful and in, in sort of, you know, helping me do that, as well as, you know, just having really great people around me that are my, my cheerleaders when sometimes I, I forget to cheer on myself. I was going to ask because I would assume that your fellow co-founders saw in you these capabilities that sometimes we don't always see in ourselves. Um, so I was going to ask if yeah, if they are some of your greatest proponents, cheerleaders, allies, um, especially if like they're in the room when some of these external voices are doubting your authority, um, like if they if they play a role in in helping to to ensure that you're reminded that you are capable. Yeah, I think it's less explicit. Uh, if anybody has, if you run across uh, Governor Bredesen, he's not the most uh, effusive person. So um, a, a lot of the times it's very much about sort of opening the doors and making structural changes and just allowing the, you know, sort of acknowledging that there is um, this opportunity, but, you know, um, um, investing in, in me as a person without saying like, Laura, you're so great. And uh, because you're a woman of color, right? It, it's much more um, implicit, uh, you know, in the way that they have championed me. I mean, one, uh, the governor approaching and, and saying that he was willing to found and fund uh, what we're doing uh, with our seat round here at Clearloop was uh, a big endorsement. Um, and I think that doing the same thing, you know, Bob and I have had a, we're, we're working on this day today. And so it has been very helpful to have somebody else who sees and experiences things uh, from a very different perspective to uh, remind me uh, or remind us of, that what we're doing is, is really important um, and that we're, you know, more than capable. And I think that we've been able to really balance each other out that way. And then just, you know, friends and family um, that have been very, um, supportive but but I think just having those allies is very very helpful because sometimes they have the ability to open things or see things or say things in a way that just opens up the possibility so I've really benefited quite a bit from you know I mentioned Jason before and Governor Bredesen and there's been you know countless of men and women uh, in my life who've, who've given me the at least the the door opening and it was up to me to just kind of burst it open and, and try to bring more people along um, to, to do the same for them. Um, and so the work continues. It's less like, yay, go rah, rah, but it is very much the that implicit um, um, and the intentionality behind opening these kinds of opportunities for somebody like me um, and giving me a shot that that I've, I've really appreciated throughout my career. I, I love that that message, the, the implicit support. I think a lot of times when people are trying to figure out how to be supportive or how to be intentional in, the, in what they're doing, um, a lot of times it, it gets misconstrued that it's the things that you're saying. Yes. Um, and, and really, yeah, the impact is the things that you're doing mm -hmm. you, and the implicit of of how you're showing it rather than just saying it out loud had right. a greater impact. Yeah, and even just little things like opening networks or, you know, uh, that sort of opportunity, that sort of, you know, opening uh, 
events or networks of people or that sort of thing is like this little tiny things we all have a linkedin we all have you know different people that we've you know run across in in different parts of our career and i think that 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 simple act um, of opening a network to somebody that may not have access to that network is so powerful um i i um, have been going down memory lane and opening up some uh, networks of my own to my little cousin, trying to get him connected with some people I went to college with. And it's just so funny to see that, you know, he wouldn't necessarily have that um, sort of access where not for, you know, somebody else knocking on a, on a door for him. And I think just that is so, you know, it takes five minutes for me and it takes in, but it's, you know, uh, a sort of, uh, lifetime of trying to tear down these uh, systems that we've created, if we can try to open up just a little sliver of, uh, of a door, um, you know, those folks will do the work of, of making the connection and maybe it doesn't, it's not necessarily a immediate, uh, you know, internship opportunity or job opportunity, but just knowing that you're in the same mix uh, is always a, a really powerful um, component of, of, of the championship and allyship that we're talking about. I, I think a lot of, we forget that there's still an immense power sometimes in a single email. Um, I, I think, you know, we get inundated with emails all the time. We forget that it can mean the world to one person that you made this connection to a friend of yours that you didn't even think anything of, but you're like, oh yeah, you should probably meet because mm -hmm. it's a good person to talk to. And it like, yeah, it can have so many. And we, we, cause we don't necessarily see that ripple. Um, but yeah, it can be, it can be the biggest thing. Um, yeah. And it may not be the ripple right away, right? It doesn't necessarily click right away, but just maybe down the road, it will click, uh, in some other way. And I think that that's, you know, giving, just giving a little bit of that, that seed planting is always, uh, it, it may take a little bit of watering and time, but it, it will um, turn into something cool. Exactly. Um, so I have one question I have too is, so you've stepped into this entrepreneur role now. What has been some of the greatest surprises, whether it's surprise in a negative way or surprise in a positive way of, of now seeing yourself in this, in this different type of light? That's a good question, Catherine. Let me think on it. Um, I think the most surprising thing for me has been um how much i thought that that people would just get it right away um you know we wanted to share this idea and um you know there was a lot of willing people and a lot of listening ears and we've infor been informed by lots and lots of research and other people willing to lend um their insights and feedback and i think that we and i i certainly thought that you know, as soon as we shared it, not with the world, but like, it, you know, shared it with like minded companies or organizations, especially in the NGO community that I thought that surely things would click um, and people would see that, yeah, this is a really, this is interesting um, and let's pursue it and let's try to figure out how to make things work. Um, and I think that for me, it's been surprising that sometimes the entrepreneurial journey and the innovation journey is quite lonely um, and it's full of skeptics. And I think that that one of the ideas or one of the, the sort of pieces of wisdom that I got from somebody who's been uh, in the entrepreneurship world for a while basically said, you know, it's the, the idea is the success versus not success is sometimes, you know, you just try at the thing, try at the thing, and then it's the guy or the gal that, um, you know, gave up six months ago that just couldn't find the gold because um, it just, it, it wasn't there, but somebody else kept digging um, and, you know, finally struck gold. And I think that that's the, that's been the biggest thing. I, I thought that surely, you know, more people would say like, yeah, cleaning up the grid is a good thing and building more solar projects in the Southeast and the Midwest is a good thing. And let's try to figure out how to, how to make this work. Um, and even from people who are in that world and think in that world um, and sort of some of the pushback that we've gotten, some of the skepticism or the, um, you know, questions have been much more like, wait a second, why, why are you not, why, why don't you want to help? Um, and I, I think that that's been the most surprising, um, but also just the most rewarding in terms of, okay, fine, we just had to figure 
out who else to talk to and how else to prove out what we were trying to do and um, learn a, a lot more um, about why people were pushing back and how to address their questions and, and then finally realize sometimes that you know there's no answer to their question because the question doesn't make a ton of sense and so we just keep going. <laughs> I, I was, um, yes, I was going off of that. I was wondering, um, yeah, if you, being a communications person, um, obviously you're, you're probably much more astute of studying how are people responding? How are they talking? What, what are the words that they're using versus what the, you know, what you're trying to communicate to them and how's that being perceived? So have you had to make quite a few adjustments from how you were first trying to communicate to people and you've had to like really change to make sure that people understood fully what you're trying to do? Yeah, I think for uh, for at the beginning, it was also just an exercise of like, what is it that we are emphasizing? And so, you know, people have this, especially in the environmental world, they have a visceral reaction to offsets um, or the term offset. And so we really struggled at the beginning trying to sort of move around the fact that we were, I mean, it is a verb. Um, you're not taking the carbon out of your supply chain or, you know, reducing the carbon footprint from your um, for walls, you're taking it out of somewhere else in the in the world and in another industry. And what we were saying is, okay, take it out of the electricity grid. It's our number two polluter in in the U.S. Let's let's do that. We have the technology. Let's just invest in it. Um, and so it's it's an offset. Um, it's a it's a way of offsetting. And we really struggled with, you know, should we uh, frame it that way? And even today, there's headlines that say, you know, so and so company is doing is going to reach net carbon zero um, by or going carbon neutral and without using offsets, which is sort of you know poo poos the term. Um, but at the end of the day, is is probably they're probably doing it. Uh, they're just calling it something different, and, and we really struggle to figure out how do we communicate this. We're already you know talking um, about solar and. Uh, what that meant for the economy and and this part of the world and and so we just decided eventually to just you know embrace it lean into it and and say you know this is exactly this is this is descriptive of what we do we don't want to make it seem like we're using some sort of black box to uh to suck the uh, the carbon out of the atmosphere this is just a very simple way um of cleaning up the grid and i think that that was very informative um but i have you know, sometimes I want to overemphasize certain things or just really explain everything. And sometimes it's nice to just take a step back and listen and hear what people hear from what we're trying to do at Clear Loop and just making it, trying to simplify it has taken a lot of work and time. Um, and so we've landed on, you know, helping clean up the grid. And then a lot of people are like, what is the grid? What does that mean? Um, so trying to like not over explain and, and, and not going into a whole lot of um, words and just letting people react to the thing and and then be able to to learn from it and adjust and sort of emphasize and the part where um, we're very very uh, confident and in, in the part that we feel the most um, is the most important component of what we're doing is really all around this this idea that we should all have equitable access to clean energy in our country and that means that investing in in these communities is very very important um, and that it's not happening right now. And so that's that sort of, you know, that helps break apart uh, any arguments around offsets and all that other stuff is just like the intention behind what we're trying to do is really one of expanding access to clean energy, which is hard to argue against. Uh, I think that's a really important message. I feel like no matter what industry you're in is that, um, it doesn't necessarily always benefit by saying the, you know, what are you doing and how are you doing it? Yeah. But it's more of, you, um, you know, like Simon Sinek talks about, you know, the why of why yes. you're doing it yes. um, is what people are going to understand better than anything else, more than likely. Yes, absolutely. I, I Sometimes I struggle in between the two because you do need to know what you're doing and sort of communicate that in some ways. Because like if you look at some websites or even on LinkedIn, some companies are like, here for the betterment of the world and like it doesn't really tell you very much about what's happening so there's a there's a healthy balance but i totally agree that you gotta you gotta remember your why um to to be able to be an effective communicator 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It is the balance of, um, you know, maybe open with the why and that's like the sizzle. And then, yeah. and then you come up with the, okay, this is how we're doing it. And this is what it is um, to give validity to like, no, we don't just have this big audacious dream. Cause I, um, I've talked to my fair share of scientists that get so annoyed by marketing and communications people that have this like oh, this like whimsical unicorns and rainbow dream yeah. messaging that they're sending. And the scientists are like, well, that's not, not how it works. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah exactly. So it's like, I feel like you're misleading people here. Yes, yes. Um, great. So what, as far as since you've had to, to do some adjustments and transitions to, to being in the spot that you're in now with Clear Loop and, and having clients and, and you, you have um, the groundbreaking that's coming up, what is the the vision now of of where you you want to take clearly yeah so we're still very early this is just i think we've gotten signals that this is we're in the right um, place at the right time and i think that that's a very encouraging thing um but we need stronger signals and so i think that that's the the other thing is you know how do we grow this how do we scale this how do we make sure that it's not just the one project um in Tennessee, but we have multiples and we can show that it can be done outside of Tennessee as well in the Tennessee Valley. Um, I think that those things are always, you know, sort of this question of growth and scale will always be part of it. It's, it's very much a necessary part of, of being in a, in a young startup. And then the, the idea that we can really expand this out to a bunch of different types of companies and a bunch of different uh, uh, industries and the types of communities that we can help not just by um, investing in a clean energy project, but then, you know, what other ways can we link into that community so that they get the benefit of not just, yes, there's a nice piece of infrastructure that's being built in your town, what else um, can be done as a result? And so in Jackson, we're starting to explore the possibility of um, working together with the TCAT, um, the uh, technical college there in, in Jackson, and trying to see if we can work with their electrician program to be able to have a sort of concentration into um, electrical uh, work for PV um, for, for uh, these utility skill solar projects so that the, the, the folks that are learning how to be electricians can also have this skill that will be transferable uh, because if you know, TVA has made a big commitment about having more renewables in, in the valley and so this is an opportunity to make sure that our workforce is ready for those types of jobs and so there's all those linkages and all those things that like the work has just you know it, we were a concept stage now we're sort of concept plus um, and, and that's the exciting part about, you know, getting to create something from, from nothing. Um, it's very scary and very, you know, it could, it could sound like you know, lots of ideas and uh, that are just ideas at this point uh, and lots of conversations that are just conversations at this point. But um, I think that the, you know, being able to be, um, have an eye towards the, the, the eye of the possible and the what ifs um, is always a, an exciting part. Uh, and so that's, that's what's really next for Clearloop. And I appreciate too that I mean, one of the biggest arguments that a lot of the areas, especially that have been so reliant on fossil fuels, um, is the lack of transferable skills to that. And so the fact that you're being proactive about, look, even when you do graduate and you're learning these things for the way that the grid is now, you'll still be able to learn and have applicable skills to have a job when, when ultimately, hopefully the grid changes. Yeah, exactly. And or or that, you know, there's they thought that, you know, the electrician program was helping for just regular electrician jobs. Um, and this is a way for us to say, you know, there's also this other new big field that's growing and opening up. And here in Tennessee, we can we can have those jobs. And I think that's the that's the exciting part about this is that there's a whole world that is just opening um, on on this clean energy transition and so we want to be really thoughtful about what what happens next there's we're standing on the on the shoulders of some giants that you know were sort of the pioneers that that started this and so now um, as more and more people are realizing that hey you know investing in clean energy is a good thing um, how about we just make sure that we we do we make sure that we are sort of um, seizing and all of the other opportunities that there are to build those jobs or to create more more of a uh, bigger worldview for the kids that are coming up and are learning about what we are transitioning into now. 
I, I love that that aspect of more of this like holistic approach to it of all the different facets that it touches. Um, so my my last question that I have for you, um, and I love asking this question, but um, pretend you know going 50, 60 years into the future and looking back, what is the legacy that you're hoping to leave behind? Maybe not necessarily career wise, but just in general, you know, what is the legacy that you're hoping to leave? That's a, that's a very good question, very powerful. And oh my Lord, thinking that far into the future makes me a little nervous, but I think that, um, I think what I'm hoping um, that I can do, whether it's in my career or personal life is that I've benefited from a lot of people opening doors and I wanna be able to do the same for more and more people and sort of like pass it on and leave that, leave that chain open so that when I look back, it's not just, you know, the one intern that we had this summer who, uh, you know, got a job in something else, um, it, but but that that sort of ethos and that, that um, idea has been embraced um, and so that there's a chain uh, of different people that have come up um, just because, you know, this little door was cracked uh, for them. And I think uh, that that would be the, the most, um, I don't know, the most uh, satisfactory or the, the happiest it would make me is to know that more people and more people who didn't necessarily see themselves reflected, um, you know, women and people of color um, that uh, grow up in places like Tennessee that uh, may not be reflected in media or other places, you know, for them to be able to feel like, you know, there's a, there's an opportunity for me to grow beyond. Um, and so that's, that's really my hope um, and the way that I hope I can, I can continue to build my life. I, that's such a beautiful legacy. It, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, a, there's a fable about um, two professors that are both retired. And one of the professors was basically just sought out awards and glory for most of his career. Um, didn't really pay much attention to helping out like the, the students studying under him or anything like that. He was going for the Nobel prizes and the journals and all of that. And the other professor didn't really care about the notoriety. He cared about the students that he was bringing up on, and studying under him and where they were able to go because he was able to help them out in some way. Um, and at their retirements, the fable goes that the, the one with all the, the notoriety, all of the success, nobody came to speak to, to tell him how much they appreciated what he did for them. And the other professor had hundreds of thousands of students come to his retirement to thank him and talk about all the impact that he made. And so that that like reminds me of what you yeah. were saying of like being that that second professor um, that that cares more about the what what you mean for the next generations and, and what you can you can help them achieve. Yeah, because maybe all of them will have many more Nobel Peace Prizes and many other things. And it's just a you know multiplying that effect. I think I, I think that that's that's really, really important. And I, I hope um, I do the people who came before me proud because of yeah. that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I know you will, I am for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. So what are the, the best ways for people to connect with the work that you're doing and, and to follow along and, and see as you grow? Yeah, so obviously we have our website, clearloop.us, um, where we are trying to, you know, put all the things on there, research and other uh, announcements, but obviously our social channels, our marketing folks would be very sad if I didn't mention um, at Clearloop um, for all of the channels, except for a few that are Clearloop US. Um, on Instagram and LinkedIn and all those places, but also people, um, if they're really interested in this stuff, um, can drop me a line at hello at clearloop.us. We have a uh, internship uh, program that is very robust um, and we're looking for interns for the summer. So if any of your listeners um, are interested in the internship or their kids are interested in the internship, we're, we're certainly um, very welcoming of all the, the applications. I think the application, process starts in mid-March um, and it runs through early April. Um, and we, we pay our interns, um, which is, uh, that was, that's novel for somebody like me who grew up in politics where you're not paid for any of your work. Um, and um, we really rely on, on interns to try to help us build, you know, different aspects of Clear Loop. And so we're hoping that, you know, as much as we get out of, of the interns' times, that they also get a lot uh, out of, of their time with us. So 
um, that's my plug for, for Clearloop. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your story with us today, Laura. Well, thank you so much for the platform. And I'm so, so glad to uh, have it and know that it's being built here in Tennessee. And I really, really appreciate the time, Catherine. Thanks so much.